Some of you may recognize the name Kevin Carter. Kevin Carter was a group of notorious conflict photojournalists in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, they, were, they would go and they'd take, take these just kind of crazy pictures. You'd see like the inside of some of the most corrupt things that you've ever seen. And they, um, they had a, a really big part in kind of blowing, up and, uh, blowing open all the stories on the um, you know, police brutality and racism and all this in South Africa. But he's most known for one picture. He's most known for this one picture that he took in 1993. Um, while covering the war and famine in Sudan, you've probably seen the picture. It's a picture of a young child hunched over. You can see the bones protruding through, you know, out from their skin, um, head on the, on the ground, um, starving. It has all of the standard traits of what we've seen on the infomercials, the um, young child with the uh, bloated, you know, bloated stomach and all. And if that, that picture in and of itself wasn't enough to, to bring you to tears, uh, just a few yards behind this young child was a vulture. And the, the, the picture got the title, The Girl and the Vulture. Come to find out later, it was actually a young boy. And the story surrounding the story was that uh, this young boy was, was crawling to a humanitarian station, to an aid station that was over a half a mile away when Kevin had taken this picture. Another story that came out was that, um, that Kevin had actually waited um, over 20 minutes to snap that picture because he thought that the vulture might spread its wings and it would make for a better shot. So he waited. As you can imagine, the world was in shock when they saw the picture. March uh, 1993, it was sold to the New York Times and went syndicated worldwide. Uh, maybe you thought the same thing when you saw it that most people did. Um, what happened to the child? And they were using this picture on, on humanitarian aid posters and in infomercials and everything that they could do because it was such a, a, a picture that could raise money and they could you know, get aid and, and help with the cause. A lot of these questions ended up back at Kevin and they asked him, well, what did you do? Did you just take this picture and leave? What could you have done? And his answers got pretty defensive, as, as a lot of us might. And he was there, obviously, to, to do his job as a, as a photographer. But, but he said, you know, like, e even if I had helped this young child and shoot away this vulture, which in reports says that he actually did say that he shoot away the vulture before he left. But he says, even if I had helped this child, there were thousands more in the exact same situation. And doing this for this one child really wouldn't have made any of a difference. And so he packed up his bags after he took the shot. He got on a plane and he went off to South Sudan for another location. Uh, later on that year, actually in 94, April, Kevin would receive the Pulitzer Prize for feature film photography for this image. He was set to receive the American Magazine Picture of the Year Award, which is hardly ever given to a foreigner, but was going to be given to Kevin, but he wouldn't make it to the ceremony because before it, he took his own life. His father told the press, and I quote, that his, my son always carried around the horror of the work that he did, and in the end, it was just too much. Overwhelmed by what psychologists call the bystander effect, where we would rather take a picture or, um, you know, take a video or do something, you know, that, that keeps us at arm's distance. He was grief stricken and scared. Kevin even told his fellow photographer when he came back from that trip before they got on the plane, he's like, you're not going to believe what I just saw. I can't believe the pictures that I just captured. And so he took that feeling he took that, that awestruckness, the, all, of the, all of the feelings that he, was, that he was feeling, and he buried it. This morning, I want to talk about compassion. What, what do we do with compassion? What do we do when we hurt so much for something that seems so big? What do we do with our, our tendency to be bystanders and not participators? What do we, where do we take this pain? How do, we, how do we change the world when it feels like all we're doing is, is shooing a vulture away to the next starving child? How do we love a world that seems so dark and divided? The answer, I think, is one word, and it's compassion. But I also think we have compassion defined weirdly in our, in our culture. We have, we've taken compassion and we've turned it into a, a feeling that we kind of feel in our gut. So this morning I want to talk about compassion and, and, and I want to go straight to the Bible. In the Bible there are multiple words used for compassion. 
all over. There's all different kinds of why, why they would use that word for love, compassion, mercy. But there's one in particular that stands out. And we see this word about 25 times in the New Testament. And it's actually one of the more fun words in the New Testament to say. I'm going to bring it up here on the screen. This is the word splanknon. Everybody say it with me. One, two, three, splanknon. All right? You're like halfway to being a Greek scholar. Pat yourself on the back. Splanknon. You know, you know Greek. Splanknon is this word that we see for compassion over and over again. Like I said, 25 times in the New Testament. And there's a couple interesting things about this word, splanknon. Uh, the first is the literal translation of the word. The literal translation of splanknon, which is used for everything from heart to tender heartedness to compassion to mercy to pity. The literal translation of the word from the Greek is bowels. Cute, right? <laughs> The bowels. We're just coming off of, you know, Valentine's week. How many of you gentlemen poured your bowels? I don't want to know that's a story. Poured your heart out. And this is because the ancient Greeks believed that, that all of your deepest emotions, all of the, the, the depths of the emotion that we can feel as humans would not come from your heart. It wouldn't come from, you know, like if you're feeling something in your heart, you need to go see a doctor, right? Like it wasn't from the heart. It wasn't a lump in the throat. It wasn't butterflies in the chest. It came from your bowels. It came from deep inside of you. And so this is what the ancient Greeks believe, which is why this literal word would mean the vital organs. You feel it in the pit of your stomach. Some of you medical-minded people might recognize terms like splanchnic nerve or splanchnic circulation, the nerves and the blood flow surrounding the abdomen and the vital organs. Actually, the Hebrew equivalent of this word, so we see that same word meaning, with the same type of meaning in the Old Testament, would actually mean the vital organs that they would remove from the sacrifice and set off to the side for just a, a lovely dinner later, that they would take everything else and sacrifice that. And these vital organs, the splanchnon, would be set aside because they were vital and they were special. The splanchnon, meaning bowels or inner parts. Remember that is interesting about the word splanchnon. Another thing that's interesting about the word, maybe most interesting for our message this morning, is that in all other Greek literature, not just Bible literature, but all other known Greek literature, which is a lot, this word is a noun, splanchnon. It described the feeling or the idea or what someone felt um, in their bowels. It was a noun. But when we see this word in the Gospels describing how Jesus felt towards people and towards crowds, only here in Greek literature is it changed to a verb. Jesus not only had compassion, but he showed compassion in his actions. And actually the word changes a little bit from splanknon to splanknizomai. That doesn't really matter because that doesn't make sense to us. But it's a different word when you see it used of Jesus. Splanknizomai. And we've been talking about this idea of one at a time living based on the book by Kyle Eidelman, um, but also looking at just the approach that Jesus took to people. And when it comes to compassion, I don't think it's an accident or a textual variant or some you know, grammatical error that Jesus is the only one who turns this noun into a verb because when we live for Jesus and when we strive to engage one person at a time with the love of Christ, you have to move compassion from the pit of your stomach to the palms of your hands. It has to move. It has to move you. It doesn't just stay swallowed in your stomach. Every time we see Jesus have this compassion, it's followed by action. Mark chapter six, we see that Jesus has compassion on the crowds and just a few short voice verses later, he's feeding 5,000 plus of them. There's action. It doesn't just stay in the pit of his stomach. It comes out in action. Matthew chapter 20, he has compassion on the two, uh, the two blind men who come to him and ask for healing. Not only does he heal them, but he reaches out and touches them. There's a physical situation here. There's something that he has actually moved to touch them and to go towards them. Matthew chapter 9, he has compassion on the crowd once again. And he turns directly to his disciples and he commands them to pray to the Lord of the harvest because these are like sheep without a shepherd. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. And so he has compassion on the crowd. It leads him directly to prayer. The founder of Iris Global and missionary Heidi Baker would say it this way of Jesus' compassion. Jesus would go anywhere and talk to anyone 
Uh, and whenever he went, he would stop for the one, the forgotten one, the one who was rejected, outcast, sick, even stone dead. In the kingdom of God's love, there is no sinner that cannot come home. Jesus didn't just have compassion, he showed compassion. And we're going to look this morning in Mark chapter 1. So if you brought your Bibles this morning, we'll also have the scripture on the screen here. But Mark chapter 1, where Jesus heals a man with leprosy. It's seemingly just a few verses. It's a small little story. But I think in this story, we can see some of the principles of true compassion. What does it look like when we move compassion from the pit of our stomach to the palms of our hands? I think Jesus shows us in this healing. So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. But I'll give you the first principle of true compassion is this. True compassion is loving people who are unlike you. True compassion is loving people who are unlike you. Look at verse 39. He, Jesus, went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him, on his knees begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So Jesus has been going from town to town. It's one of the more um, packed chapters of the scriptures where we see Jesus at work. I mean, if you, if you read Mark chapter one, you're just like, what happened to the angels and the birth narratives and all that sort of stuff? What happened to you know, Mary and Joseph and all that kind of slow roll into the life of Jesus? It is like, you know, we hear John the Baptist, Jesus comes, and then it's ministry, okay? Mark is pretty brief with all of his descriptions. He just gets to the point. And Jesus has this, this 72 hours or so of just ministry, ministry, casting out demons and going. And it's been, it's been doing all of, all of this, driving out demons in the synagogues and the cities. He's getting really, really popular before we even finish the first chapter of Mark. And if you're like me and you grew up in church, you've heard stories of Jesus healing men with leprosy. And, and you, you might have even heard what leprosy was. And we kind of, we kind of think about it as this kind of distant thing. It's actually, a, um, it's actually a disease that still exists today. But I'm a, little bit, uh, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that before now, before just a, about a year ago, when I saw an episode of The Chosen, you guys are watching this show, The Chosen, um, before I saw that, there's, there's one episode last year that I saw where a leper approaches Jesus and the disciples and the reaction is, is, so, is so like defensive. The disciples are immediately protective of their rabbi. They're just saying, get away, he's unclean. He's, he's, he's not supposed to be here. And you kind of get a glimpse of what it actually would be like to be someone with leprosy. You see, this disease that I said actually still exists today is pretty rare today. But even the cases that we have today are way less contagious than they were in Bible times. Those who had it were banished from public life, often forced to live in communities all by themselves with other people with the same uh, disease. They had to announce themselves before coming into a crowded space, before walking anywhere. They had, if they knew other people were coming, they'd have to shout out, unclean, unclean, so that everybody knew to keep their distance. And... It was even said, I, I found one commentator said, it was even said that the, um, the clay walls of the houses that they had in those times, like if someone with leprosy were to lean up against one of those walls with, with bare skin, that, that the leprosy could actually stay in the clay walls and someone could come along later and lean up or be in, in the vicinity of it and could actually contract leprosy that way. Highly contagious disease, something you had to be, you know, quarantined or set aside. Now, I was thinking if there was only some sort of equivalent in the modern day that we had to stay away, that we had to, you know, like that it, it was like, so, okay, did anybody else wash your groceries in 2020? Are we just that, or are we just crazy? Okay, um, uh, I remember that 2020, early 2020, my wife was working at the hospital. She's working these long 12 hour shifts. And she would come home and we were like really, really trying to protect our family. And so as she would come in to the garage door, we would make her shout, unclean, unclean. Like, I'm just, I'm just kidding. We didn't let her in the house at all. Um, <laughs> here's something that I actually found fascinating though. If you read the rabbinic text that surrounded leprosy in the times of, of that era, um, there were so many rules on how you could interact with people if you had leprosy, if you had this disease and how they were gonna you know, stop the spread of it. And this, this kind of blew my mind when I found in the rabbinic text, there was a, there was a distance. Some of you know where I'm going with this. There, how, when was the first time you heard the word, the word social and distance put together, right? Okay, 2020 for me, some of you introverts are like, been living in my whole life, right? Like, it's my favorite two words smashed together. But, but this actually goes all the way back to the first century and before, 
where they had rules and laws of how far someone with leprosy had to stay away from crowds and people. They had to announce themselves as unclean, but they also had to stay four cubits away, which is 18 inches, which is, you guys are really good at math, six feet, (laughs) six feet of distance. Some things never change. So here we have this man. He does not follow the rules. He does not follow the rabbinic text. He runs up to Jesus. He slides down on his knees and he begs Jesus, I know that you can, if you're willing, heal me. Notice the faith of this man. He's willing to be, I don't know, maybe beaten by disciples, maybe, maybe, you know, shunned away, even ostracized even more, willing to be punished. But he has this faith and he knows Jesus is not a doctor. There is no cure for leprosy, but he knows something about this Jesus. He's heard something about this Jesus that he believes that he can be healed. And Jesus had every right as a Jewish man to dismiss him, to run from him, to call the officials, to send him back to his quarantine. He had every right to do that. But just like he ruined his reputation with with everybody else that he hung out with, so he hangs out with tax collectors and sinners, and now he's unclean because he's touched lepers. He ran that risk. Jesus showed compassion by loving those who were unlike him. This requires, of course, getting into the spaces with people who are unlike you. How do we do that? How do we, how do we find people that are unlike us? Well, I have, a, I have a friend who's a college minister in Louisville who used to say it this way. He would always say, live a life where you look out for the left out. Look out for the left out. That'd make a really great bumper sticker, okay? Maybe just look out for some of you driving around Springfield. like, And then really small for the left out. Look out for the left out. There's, there, there's something about seeing somebody who is distant, seeing someone who is overlooked. I used to tell my, uh, my middle school youth group, that's right, I was a middle school minister at one point in my life. Pray for Garrett, pray for Garrett. I, I lasted two years. Um, but, but I used to tell our middle schoolers because they would all come in on Wednesday nights to our, uh, to our you know, Bible study and worship and they'd all rush to the front of the stage and we'd have really, you know, we'd have the loud worship and I would get up and I would speak and it was like, it was, it was such a moment sometimes. It was so much fun and all the kids were so into it. It felt like, you know, one of those like Thursday night at, at uh, church camp or something. But one perspective that I got to have of that was when I stood on stage, I got to see the crowd in front of the stage, but I also got to see the back wall kind of peppered with those who didn't feel like they were a part of the crowd or their parents had just brought them and dropped them off or they had just kind of walked to church because they lived in a neighborhood right beside it and they heard there were going to be a lot of people there or those who had come and didn't want to be a part of the group at all but found themselves in our youth group at that time and so I would always tell our um, literally tell our middle schoolers to look to the back look to the corners look to the dark spaces where people get overlooked look out for the left out. If there's one thing that our world has conditioned us to do very well is to see people who are different than us, is to see people who are unlike us. We're very careful to watch what people say, how people dress, what neighborhoods they come from, what schools they go to, what they post online. Did they share that hashtag? Did they get that shot? Did they wear that red hat? Like all of it. We're we're pretty good and conditioned to go, I've, I've known you for about five minutes and I've kind of got you put in a place, right? And if there's, only, if there's one redeeming thing about that, about knowing where everyone is in their place, uh, is that it's pretty easy to identify who Jesus wants you to have compassion on. Compassion is loving those who are unlike you. Compassion is loving those who are in the corners or in the dark spaces or in the places we would never go. Compassion It's loving those who are unlike you. Look at verse 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. I am willing, he told him. Be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Here's principle number two of true compassion. True compassion is more contagious than uncleanliness. Sometimes we keep our arms distance because we think we're going to be rubbed off on or we think we're going to, you know, something, some, we get too close to this sinfulness or this uncleanliness and it will rub off on me. Jesus is, is, is teaching us this lesson and he's banking on this principle that the opposite will happen. That in Jesus' willingness to touch this man, he's not assuming that the uncleanliness will be what spreads, but it's the compassion that spreads. I learned this lesson in a small little town called Sombrete, Mexico. 
It's about four hours across the border from Eagle Pass, Texas. Some of you have actually been there. Um, Our campus ministry used to take trips there, and we would go and take like over 100 students, about 11 to 12 church buses, which looks kind of like the FBI's rolling into town if you do that. But uh, we, all, we would all go down there and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd camp at this, um, at this church camp that was in this small little town. Not a huge town. Like it's, it's probably smaller than like our, our land that we have here. But we would take over this church camp and while we were there, we would, we would help them like re-roof houses or small little churches in the areas or we would help repaint stuff and keep, upkeep the dorms that we would stay in every year as well so that they could have summer camps. We'd do this on spring break. They'd have summer camps just filled with kids coming to this small little camp. And I remember one of the first nights I was in Sombrete um, in the kind of later afternoon after all the work projects were done or whatever, you could just kind of rest and relax. But there was always lots of little kids kind of just getting out of school. They were coming around and they would always come and want us to play soccer with us. And we're like, yeah, we're good at soccer. Let's go play soccer. Not so much. (laughs) And so we would follow these kids all through the, you know, like through the little dusty roads of the town. And we were like, they're going to take us to the soccer field. And we'd come to this clearing, this opening, which we thought we were still had some time to get to the soccer field. But this was the soccer field. It was just kind of a dirt field with a kind of a net hung up over here that was going to be, you know, the goal here. And, you know, another net that they had found over here. There were trees in the middle of the field and they were, taking, they were taking sticks and kind of marking out the, you know, out of bounds lines and all of this sort of stuff. They had a ball that just didn't even have the plastic stuff on it anymore. It was just, you know, kind of like, a, like all worn down like you've seen. And I don't even know if it was originally a, a, a soccer ball, but, and I remember that moment kind of coming to that clearing, looking at the field and realizing a few things. It's not a pause that I'm proud of. But I stopped and I said to myself, I only brought two pairs of shoes on this trip. I I brought my work boots and my white Nike tennis shoes. And that's what I was wearing because I thought we were playing soccer, which I thought was played on grass. Okay. I said, I'm not proud of it. And then I started to realize that all of my kind of athletic clothes, the stuff that I had put on, you know, was, was nicer. And I started to look at these kids and I started to see them and how dirty they were and how, you know, like, I was like, man, I'm starting to think about, you know, like lice and I'm starting to think about how filthy I'm going to be by the end of this week. I'm starting to think like, we don't really have hot showers back at the, at the dorms. They're kind of cold. So maybe I want to like take it a little bit easy, that sort of stuff. And so, so, but the Holy Spirit in that moment convicts me and says, you didn't come here to keep your clothes clean. You know, at that time in my life, I had a couple nieces and a nephew, and one of my favorite things in the world was to play tag and give them piggyback rides and chase them around and wrestle on the ground with them and all that sort of stuff. And that never, ever bothered me because I knew where they had been and where they were going back to and all of that. And this moment for me was, a, was kind of a make or break moment in compassion. And so what I learned was that my, my first feeling was not compassion. I was, but I, I, I knew soon that I wasn't there to clean these kids up. I wasn't there to keep my stuff clean. I wasn't there to make their field nicer or to judge them for what they had. I was there, like Jesus reaches out to this man who had probably not been touched in years. I was there to give hugs and piggybacks and piggyback rides and chase and play tag And I was there to ruin every shirt and pair of shorts that I had. I was there to just completely destroy those white tennis shoes because compassion is more contagious than uncleanliness. I wish I could have, I wish I would have brought the picture because I have a picture of a young little boy um, and it it looks like I'm torturing him a little bit, but I think he just scored so many goals on us that I just grabbed him by his feet and held him upside down like this. And uh, it's just kind of the perfect picture of that moment of just like, okay, this is the only way I can stop you from scoring. Um, But it's also me going like, this is crazy, but this is compassion. Jesus could have healed this man from six feet away. He could have been like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Remember the rules? He could have like, you know, you're healed. But notice that he touches him. He reaches and physically touches him. If you read throughout the Gospels, when you see Jesus physically touches somebody, it's not in there as an accident. It's not in there as just like a side note or something. When Jesus touches someone, something miraculous is happening, and Jesus is showing a compassion beyond the pit of his stomach. It could have been for the disciples to just see that everything is okay. 
we're going to be all right. The people watching to sh- truly show God's power over disease and that Jesus possessed that power. But I think it's more than that. I think there's something about the power of touch that lets us know that the compassion we're showing is more contagious than the uncleanliness that might rub off on us. In the late 70s, they had these studies in Cambodia. Um, w- w- in Cambodia, in the 1970s, the infant mortality rate for, um, for NICU babies was 70%. 70% of babies born before their term date or born, um, born underweight and had to spend some time in the NICU, 70% of them did not live to see the outside of the hospital. They were short on incubators. They didn't have very many, maybe a couple. They also didn't have the staff or the infrastructure to support it. So they started doing these studies on um, skin-to-skin contact with a mother and a baby. Some of you know about this. They called it kangaroo care, where the, where the mother would have constant skin-to-skin contact with their baby. And over the course of implementing this, over the course of just a couple years, they found the infant mortality rate went from 70% to 30% because of this one change, the power of human touch, the warmth of another body, the warmth of a hand on your shoulder, power of touch. In the 2008 and 2009 NBA season, researchers did um, a a study and they tracked every single NBA team, all 30 NBA teams. They took one game in the first two months of the season and they tracked every bit of physical touch between teammates. All of it. Imagine being on that research team, right? Every high five, every fist bump, every chest bump, every, every, every good game, you know, all of that was tracked, okay? They found that the teams with the most physical interaction during the game, from the opening whistle to the the last horn, that they had the most physical interaction during the game with all of these different ways they showed affection to one another. The teams had more, um, they, they were finding more open shots. They had more chemistry with their teammates and some of that's not really quantifiable. You're like, well, okay, well, how did they figure that out? They were also the top teams in the league in scoring, assist, and also record. And as you can guess, The research also showed that the worst teams in the league had the least amount of touch represented on the court and in the huddle. There's something about the power of touch. We're still figuring all of this out. We're still trying to understand, but Jesus is showing us clearly. If you wanna show someone you have compassion for them, don't keep them at arm's length. It gains trust, it, gains, uh, it makes things personal. It tells a person that, that you have true compassion and you're not willing to let reputation or smell or dirt or any of that unperceived or that perceived cl- uncleanliness get in the way. Compassion is more contagious than uncleanliness, which I think leads directly to the third principle of true compassion. True compassion is about connection. It's about connection. Look at what it says in verse 43. Then he suddenly, then he sternly warned him. So Jesus says to him, he sent him away at once telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest. Offer what Moses commanded for you, uh, for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Make sure everybody else knows that you were cleansed. Like keep it quiet, but get to the priest. And I want the priest to see that you've actually been healed of this. Show him the scars. Show him, tell him your story. Go do the sacrifice, do the right ritual way so that you'll be invited back in to the community. Jesus, Jesus doesn't just look out for the left out. He doesn't just heal the man. He doesn't just, in, he doesn't just say, now go, tell your story. And he doesn't even look at him and say, now come follow me. You're in my group now. No, he sends him back to, to integrate him back into the community that he has been separated from for who knows how long. Notice Jesus tells him to go to the priest. There was a sacrifice that he was to give. But just like any of us would have done, he starts telling people. You know, he goes off and he starts telling people. But, but Jesus is, is, is this one at, a time, one at a time approach of Jesus. This is, this is what it does. It invites us back into community. It invites those who are in the corners and in the dark and in the left. Now, those are the, who are left out. It invites them back into a community or to a community for the first time. I'm not just going to fill up your gas tank and hope that I never see you again. I'm going to put my arm around you. I'm going to ask you if I can pray for you. I'm going to... Um, 
I'm going to ask, is there any needs that you have right now? See, one of the things that I think we like to do is we like to show compassion. It comes from the pit of our stomach, and it comes to the palms of our hands. We'll fill up a gas tank, or we'll buy someone a meal, or we'll pay for their night in the hotel, or whatever it is they need. And then we'll drop them a card and say, hey, why don't you join me at my church on Sunday morning? Have you met my pastor? Like, that's, that's kind of the end of our, of our compassion, why don't you come here? And what I've realized is a lot of times when I meet people, like a lot of times as college students, when I meet a college student, an international student, and I ask them, hey, do you have a church home? You want to come to church? It's like, well, I don't have a car. I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't drive. You meet somebody who counts on the bus system here in Springfield to get them. Do you know where a bus would drop them off closest to this church? It's come and go. And so when our compassion comes out to the palms of our hands and we're like, my my only go-to is just I'm gonna invite him to church. That can fall so short of what Jesus is really calling us to do. Jesus doesn't just say, now go to the priest and everything will be okay. He says, go to the priest, do the appropriate things. He is giving him the tools. He's giving him the steps to get back into community. This one at a time approach does just that. I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm going to understand that true compassion doesn't end with a handout, but it ends with a handshake. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the club. Come inside. You know, we have small groups, life groups, micro groups. We've got a lot of groups around here that aren't just this group on Sunday morning. And some of you are like, well, that, we don't have any of those close to my house, or we don't have one of those, you know, at, at my office, lunchtime Bible studies, morning devotions with coworkers. Maybe God is telling you to show compassion and invite someone into a community and share the love of Jesus with them by just inviting them to something small, inviting them over for dinner, not keeping them at arm's length. As Rosaria Butterfield would say it in the title of her book, the gospel comes with a house key or a garage code since we're in 2020, right? Some of you are like, well, I don't even have a house key. And the gospel invites in invites people in. There's one more verse in this passage that I think gives us the fourth and final principle. When it comes to, when it comes to compassion, we'll just read the verse here, verse 45. It says, yet, <laughs> she's like, but. But he went out and he began to proclaim it wildly, just as, as, as any of us would, to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. He was out in the deserted places It came to him from everywhere. Jesus wanted him to keep it quiet, not because he didn't want people to know that he could heal, not not because he didn't want people to know that he was the son of God, but there was a divine timing. There was a a ministry plan for Jesus. He didn't want to go off and get himself killed too early. There was all of this happening. And so Jesus has to kind of lay low now. This is huge, just like, just like we would if we were healed and our lives were completely changed and we're invited back into the community. Man, before I even got to the priest, I would call everyone that I knew and be like, I can come to the party again. I'm invited back in. I'm not unclean anymore. I'm, I'm here, I've been healed. So I, we, we don't even know if he made it to the priest, but he just starts telling everybody. And Jesus' popularity goes from pretty popular to viral. And It's so much so that Jesus has to start staying away from the cities and the towns. Here's the fourth principle. True compassion is going to cost you something. If it doesn't, it's still a noun in your stomach and not a verb in the palms of your hands. It it doesn't cost you anything. Counting the cost often keeps us from one at a time living. It convinces us that we're too busy or that we're too important, or that I dress too nice to be dealing with this today. I don't want to crease my sneakers to bend down to pray for this person and help them up. Like, right? It keeps compassion in the pit of our stomach and never reaches the palms of our hands. I'm going to close. I say close. Don't get too excited. Um, with a story of Everett Swanson. Some of you may have heard that name before. I think it kind of bookends the, the story I told in the beginning of the sermon in this story. Everett Swanson was a missionary and preacher in the early 50s at the height of the Korean War. He jumps on a plane in Chicago and flies to Korea to preach to the American troops who are fighting in the war. When he arrives, it's the dead of winter, but he's from Chicago, so he, he's ready for it. So he's got his big park, his big coat and the fur and all of this. And he's kind of wandering the streets for a day or so. 
And then when he gets to the place where he's supposed to stay while he's there for the duration, he gets in the house, it's warmer, so he pulls off his big parka, his big coat, and he lays it there on the floor. And no sooner as it hits the ground of the place he was staying, there's a small little child grabs his coat and bolts out the door into the cold. Now, Everett is a preacher, so he knows Jesus' commands, right? When Jesus said, somebody comes and knocks on your door and says, you know, I want your shirt, don't just give him your shirt, but give him your coat as well. And so he's thinking this, but he's also from Chicago, so he's like, ain't no way this is happening. So he takes off after this young man, and he's running through the streets of this Korean town. Now, I've got a three-year-old at home, and if you've ever chased a three-year-old thinking, I've got twice as long legs as this child, I will catch her in no time. You know that that is just a false narrative, right? There's no way. And let me give you a hint. For new parents, when they're naked, they're faster. I don't know if that doesn't, that doesn't matter here, but it matters to somebody. You're going you're gonna to be like, he told me, he told me, all right? They're slippery and they're fast. So this little kid is running through the streets, fully clothed from what I know. Um, he's dodging in and out of people underneath legs and in alleys. And obviously he knows the streets better than Everett does. And Everett is just, you know, he finds him, then he loses him. He finds him, then he loses him. And then he finally gets to a point where he's, he's stretching out his legs really, really big and he's so close, he can reach out and almost grab this kid. And right before he does, the kid ducks down a really, really quick alley and vanishes. As Everett turns the corner, this kid is nowhere to be found, but he sees his coat. His coat is laying there on the ground, kind of in a heap of nothing. He was like, well, I guess this was effective. And he, he bends over to pick up his coat and underneath his coat is a small little baby. This wasn't a magic trick, by the way. He had found himself on the yard of what's kind of an, an open air housing place for orphans. Kind of an open air orphanage of, of kids who had lost their parents in the war. And he realized as he's, as he's starting to look around, there's other coats and other little rags and tattered things laying all over the field. And he starts to look and see that under, underneath every one of these is another little precious baby. In the pit of his stomach, he runs to the nearest soup shop that he can find and he buys just as much soup as he can and he comes and he's, he starts to help and aid in this way. This isn't why he came to Korea, but it's why he was here now. He helps the troops. There was American troops who would come every morning and kind of inspect the field for children who didn't make it through the cold night. And they would load them up in a truck and take them away to be buried and so Everett had gone as a missionary to American troops, but now there's, there's a new pit in his stomach. There's a new calling and passion. And, and all the way through his trip there and all the way back home, hours and hours on the plane, he says that the, the engine of the propeller of the plane sounded like it was saying, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? When he arrives back in Chicago, he has multiple meetings with multiple businessmen, one that he, sit, he would sit in his office and as he's telling him this story, I've got to do something, I don't know what to do, I don't know how I can help. This businessman opens the top drawer of his desk and hands, hands Everett a thousand dollar check. A thousand dollars in 1952 is the equivalent of about $11,200 today. And he hands him this check. It doesn't have a name on it, but he's already written it out a thousand dollars and he's signed it. And he said, a couple weeks ago, the Lord told me to write this check, to put it in my desk, because it was going to be used to help orphans and widows. He signs the check over to Everett, and that's the beginning of what we know now as Compassion International. An organization that has provided food and aid to over 2 million children worldwide. Many of you likely have a little cardboard cutout picture of a compassion child at some point on your fridge. When compassion moves from the pit of your stomach to the palms of your hands, it costs you something. Maybe you're the one that opens the wallet. Maybe you're the one with the checkbook. Maybe you're the one that loses your coat. Or maybe you're the one that misses the perfect opportunity, the perfect picture, the, the, the chance to, to make money the chance to make the big sale, the chance to not miss your next flight, or maybe it cost you more. I remember visiting two doctors who lived in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. This was uh, West Memphis. Uh, 
West Memphis, Tennessee is, is a pretty rough place. If you get really, really close to the, to the river, they've kind of remodeled all of the houses there. And then there's like the children's hospital area. It's all really, really nice. But just a little bit farther east of there, you get in to some, some pretty rough places. And we sat in the home of these two doctors who could have lived anywhere in the surrounding areas. They could have moved out to the expensive houses in the suburbs. They could have lived even you know, closer to the river where these really things, but they, they chose to love this community by living in this community. And they lived in a house in a neighborhood called Orange Mound. And, and we, we listened to their stories and we started to listen to all the stuff that had been stolen from their house. We started to look and go like, what on earth? They had laptops stolen. They had, you know, their, their couches were just an absolute mess. They had clothes disappear, couches covered in stains and cars broken into and all of this. As they're telling this story, they're not saying these things and like, man, I wish we didn't live here. We'd have more laptops or you know, they were like, well, we went down to the store the next day and bought another laptop. It's kind of the cost of living among people who don't know Jesus. And we sat there in their living room seeing that they understood that compassion comes at a cost. Compassion will make you late for lunches. It will make you miss tea times. It may make you have a tea time and you don't even like golf. True compassion will make you rearrange your budget, open room in your home. Your couch might get dirty. Your sneakers might get creased. The willingness to kneel down to help someone, to touch someone who you would normally not touch. Your personal space might get invaded. But when compassion leaves your stomach and comes to your hands, it's a call and it costs. You know, when Jesus asked Peter if he loved him, you remember Remember, Peter denies Jesus three times before the crucifixion, and Jesus comes back to him after he's resurrected, and he restores Peter by asking him these three questions. For the three times that Peter denied him, he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And each time when Peter says, yes, you know I love you, Jesus gives him the same response, feed my sheep, tend to my lambs. I think we tend to think that Peter was going to be able to feed sheep without smelling like sheep. Without, without understanding that there was a cost. Without understanding, as Bonhoeffer would say, that the call to Christ is a call to come and die to yourself. So when Jesus moves compassion from the pit of his stomach to the palms of his hands, it cost him. We see in Mark 1 that it cost him his, his kind of reputation. He was kind of growing a following, and everything was pretty positive until this point. But he knew that he couldn't go back into Jerusalem. He couldn't go back into the towns. He couldn't, he couldn't really hit the hot spots of Galilee where the most people were because there was a cost. And we fast forward to Mark chapter 15, and we see the actual cost of compassion when Jesus lays down his life because he saw the crowds, he saw us like sheep without a shepherd and that compassion from the pit of his stomach reached the palms of his hands and nails were driven through them and he sacrifices everything because he wasn't willing to just feel compassion. There's a small, I say small, movement happening in our country right now. I don't want to make it feel like it's just happening here because we just heard from the Kovals and we, we see what's happening across the world, but about eight hours from here at Asbury University in the chapel earlier this month, a revival started. Students came to a chapel session and this is, this is kind of insulting if you were the one speaking at that chapel session, but people are saying like it wasn't even a very great sermon. It's like, yikes. I hope that's what happens here today. But it wasn't even a great sermon. I've watched the last kind of 90 seconds of the sermon. They posted it online. I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of run-of-the-mill Bible college sermon, right? Okay, got to make it to class. But what happened after that sermon is that students kind of started to scatter and about 10 or 15 of them kind of stayed around and they started having this little small group session right there. The music kept playing and they didn't just want to sit there and sing. They started confessing their sins to one another. 
They started repenting of their secret hidden sins. They started talking about the gospel with one another. And that grew from 15 to 20 to 30 to 40. And even today, there is a line outside of Asbury Chapel on, on the college campus. If you wanted to go there today and get in, you'd be waiting for hours to just get in to be able to see what's going on in there. There's no celebrity on stage preaching. There's no guest speaker, no famous worship band. There's none of that. As a matter of fact, all of the, the people in the media who are like, we'd like to come and do a story on the revival. They're like, that's not, that's not what this is about. This is a move of the Holy Spirit in this moment. And I look and I've always worked um, with the next generation. Uh, from, my, from working as a mi middle school minister to a college minister, I've always worked in the next generation. And I've also always been able to kind of pretend I was part of the next generation. <laughs> I turned 40 on Thursday and uh, I was talking to somebody in between the services like, oh, somebody, people will actually start listening to you now, a respectable age. And I look at the generation that's coming up and I see this revival that is led by, every person that they interview there says the same thing. It's led by worship and prayer, confession and repentance. There's a bunch of stuff that we think Christianity is that's not on that list. And I don't think they're trying to set a record for the longest worship service to ever be had. I don't think they're trying to get notoriety or go viral or whatever. They're just having the spirit lead. As a matter of fact, this week, the, the, the faculty at Asbury and some of these leading students are trying to figure out now, what, what do we do now? Because this isn't about setting a, a worship record. How, how do we take this from in here and put it out there? One of, the, one of the campus pastors said it this way. They said, this revival is the anti-Vegas. It's not what happens here stays here. It's what happens here goes there. And if this doesn't move you, if your immediate, if your immediate feeling is cynicism, you're like, ah, it's Gen Z. They never stick out anything. We should, I felt it. You're like, oh, this will last a, a little bit. It'll go viral, somebody will ruin it, whatever. It'll be just a blip on the radar. And, I, and it may be, who knows? A week and a half in, who knows? But I see a generation that is starving for hope, that is starving for truth, that is starving for the Holy Spirit to come and do something real, that is starving for that real compassion, that we wouldn't just feel it in our stomachs, and take some justifying Pepto-Bismol and go, somebody else will take care of it. I'll introduce them to my pastor, some super Christian or some Billy Graham will come along and take care of all of this. But we feel it as our responsibility to move that from the pits of our stomach to the palms of our hands. Worship, prayer, confession, repentance. It's the path of Jesus. I wanna pray this morning for anyone who's in this room. This has kind of been an inside baseball talk. We've been talking about how do we leave this place and show compassion to our community. I wanna to talk to anybody in this room this morning that doesn't know that compassion of Jesus. And maybe you think Christianity is one thing and you hear what Jesus did and it feels like another thing. I just pray that you would lean into the spirit this morning, that you would feel that true compassion that Jesus was not willing to just stay up in heaven and dictate everything that happened down here, but he came as a man. He lived our lives. He was tempted in every way that we were tempted. And he wants your heart. If that's you this morning, I'd love to talk with you. As we're worshiping and singing, they're gonna open these doors off to the right. I'd love to talk with you about what it means to take steps towards Jesus. And maybe that step leads you directly into this baptistry. I pray this morning that the spirit would overflow in this place, overflow so much that we feel like it can't stay in the stomach, it can't stay in this building, it can't stay in these walls. But 50 years from now, we would be talking about that movement of God where we refuse to just go to lunch after church, which showed true compassion to our city and to those who are left out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, I want to pray for the one. I want to pray for the one that you left heaven for. God, the one sheep who has gone astray, the one sheep who doesn't feel like they belong, the one sheep who doesn't feel like there's any coming back from what they've done. God, I pray that you would reveal brokenness and sin, but also know, have us know that your compassion 
that your kindness leads us to repentance and leads us to walk in a newness of life. God, help us to feel that. Help us to live in that. Help this pit of our stomach that longs for a generation to know Jesus, to come to the palms of our hands, to serve and to love and to be, to be the hands and feet of Jesus today. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray.